Welcome to Hersuasion, the Art of Feminine Negotiation. I'm your host, Cindy Watson, and today it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Cheryl and Jeanette. I had the pleasure of connecting with Cheryl on Clubhouse. She runs a room on imposter syndrome and always brings such incredible value to the table. And she often joins our Art of Feminine Negotiation rooms in Clubhouse as well. So welcome, Cheryl. It is so great to have you here. So great to be here, Cindy. Thank you. And today for our listeners, we're going to be talking about negotiating past imposter syndrome. And for those of you who don't know Cheryl, Cheryl Anjanette is an expert in imposter syndrome and burnout. She's an author, speaker, trainer, and she brings over 30 years of high-level experience, both in the business arena as a three-time entrepreneur and C-suite executive, and then transitioned to integrative holistic wellness practices. And Cheryl holds certifications across multiple business and mindset disciplines, including cognitive behavior discipline, clinical and Ericksonian hypnotherapy, NLP, brain health, and the list goes on. You're going to be really lucky to hear. Make sure you've got a pad and pen ready. Lots and lots of incredible gems you're going to walk away with on imposter syndrome, what it is, and how you can push past it. And her book, The Imposter Lies Within, is due to release in early 2022. We're going to hear about that as well. And you can also find Cheryl's Club, The Inside Out Club, and Imposter Room on Clubhouse, the audio app. So tell us, Cheryl, let's Again, how did you come to make the transition from corporate America, if you will, to being an expert on imposter syndrome and burnout? You know, I was running my own company and I just had that extra time. I had my clients and I've always been fascinated with human potential, personal development. And it's just something I've always brought to the forefront with my clients in corporate America, wherever I was in my journey. And I decided I really wanted to do the deep dive into hypnotherapy, NLP. You know, I'd studied it kind of on the side. So I became an integrative hypnotherapist, still while running my business, still while taking my clients and um, studied NLP and then just realized I really wanted to kind of break away and just really do that. Mm, beautiful human potential. I love that. And that does not surprise me coming from you when I hear you speak. And since you started talking a bit about hypnotherapy, why, why don't we, before we dive into imposter syndrome, I know a lot of people kind of see hypnotherapy as woo woo. Um, so I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about hypnotherapy, you know, what, what it is, how you can use it effectively. Yeah, absolutely. You know, hypnosis is a state that we go into many times through the day. We do it naturally. So imagine you're reading a good book, you're watching a movie. You, have you ever driven somewhere and you just kind of don't even remember driving? So you're lost in your thought. So what actually happens in the brain is your brain waves slow down. And you know, when you're going to sleep, your brain waves start to slow down, right? And then you go to sleep. But there's a point before you're asleep where your brain waves are very slow and you go into a different, kind of a different brainwave activity. And it gives us an opportunity to drop into what's called our subconscious mind. It's all of this um, information, our emotions, our experiences, they're all held below the surface. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, you know, Cindy, it would be overwhelmed if we had all that information in front of us all the time. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. And I, I've come to really have an appreciation for some of those arts and recognizing the value. And, and it's interesting to me, a lot of the stuff that people called woo woo back in the sixties, now the science is catching up (laughs) finally. And it's like, well, (laughs) I guess they were ahead of the pack, actually all of the derision that they took, they were ahead. So let's roll up our sleeves and dig into imposter syndrome. And can you give us a definition of imposter syndrome, Cheryl? What is it and what is it not? I'm so so glad you asked that. Not just what it is, but what it isn't, because there are a lot of myths out there. So imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern where someone feels like they're not good enough or worthy or deserving in spite of their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So really, I think it's important to focus on the pattern because it becomes habitual and in spite of, because actually there's a disconnect between our accomplishments and how we feel about them. Yeah. The disconnect, somebody who's experienced imposter syndrome will feel like, you know, they're going to find me out. They're going to figure out I'm not as good as they thought. There's always this fear of exposure. They feel like a fraud. So it's not, you ask what it's not. Yeah. It's not that they're actually a fraud. This isn't something we refer to when somebody is actually a con artist (laughs) or is really a fake, right? 
right? Yeah. And not even that other people think we're a fraud. It's that we think we're a fraud. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And that's in spite of our accomplishments. I you love know? that distinction I that you draw. Yeah. Like that idea about the pattern, which I think people don't realize. So this isn't like if you just one time feel that insecurity, you know, that's normal. This is a pattern of behavior. And I love that, that when you talk about as soon as you said about not a con artist, it reminds me of that TV show. I don't know if you saw it, The Imposters on Netflix, right? So it's yeah. not that we're talking about to our listeners. Not that. And, and Cheryl, I know that you've created some archetypes to help people sort of categorize how imposter syndrome shows up. And I love your archetypes. So could you share those with us? Yeah, and it's not even really that I created the archetypes as much as I attribute these archetypes as a framework so people can really understand how imposter syndrome is showing up for them. So I use six, and you'll recognize a few of them. Some of them you may not, but there is the perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there are four times of types of perfectionism or perfectionist, <laughs> I would say. There's the people pleaser, there's the master or expert, someone who just feels like they need one more degree or certification to be good enough. There's the, what I call the Lone Ranger, but some people refer to it as the soloist. So that's the person that has trouble delegating. Yeah. They tend to do things alone and they're afraid to ask for help. Um, there is the superhero. We've heard a lot about the superhero, kind of the savior complex, but more than that that really overcompensates. And then of course, there's one that I don't think a lot of people have heard of. It's the prodigy. So that's the person that feels like they need to go from zero to hero or beginner to mastery immediately in order to be good enough because that in-between stage is too much of a slippery slope. You know, that competency staircase is where they might fail and the mm -hmm. fear of failure is so acute. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, I recognize a number of those of myself as you were speaking. Definitely perfectionist for sure. Uh, the Lone Ranger is something I've been working on, getting much better at, but that it's hard when you've been a Lone Ranger for many years. Superhero, no question. I think so many women feel we need to be super mom, super career woman, super everything, uh, and that savior complex. Um, if you don't mind me asking, which where, which uh, resonate with you? Well, you know, the most, I was, first of all, I have to say all six. Yeah, all that's six. fair. And I don't say suffer or struggle. I always say experience. So I've experienced all six. And the reason I don't say suffer or struggle is because words are very powerful, yeah. right? Our self is everything. Yeah. And it's much easier to get over an experience than something that we're suffering or struggling with. So that's really, really important. But I would say all six, people pleaser for me has been the most painful. Mm -hmm. That one was the most painful, but perfectionism, huge. Yeah. That uh, Lone Ranger, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you really put a pin in that idea about language matters because so often I, I was very careful, even when COVID hit, to not talk about this being a challenge or these difficult times. It was these unusual times, right? These unfamiliar, perhaps. And, and I often joke and say, I'm guilty of this. But as you call that out, Cheryl, that's a really good point because even that guilt attributes when we feel that guilt or shame as opposed to more positive emotions. So I think that was a great, great call out there for our listeners. So tell us a little bit about where imposter syndrome comes from. You know, imposter, that's such a good question. Imposter syndrome really begins in our formative years, those imprint years from three to 11. Now we can build after that, absolutely. But that's why it's so important to kind of do that deep dive, that in, you know, you've heard me talk about this. I really believe in doing an inside out and an outside in approach that we have to do that deeper dive to get those early beliefs. Because here's what happens, Cindy, when we have an experience, and let's say this begins when we're very young, usually the first memories are around three, um, we have an experience, but it's not so much the experience we had, but it's the meaning we gave it or the interpretation we had of it. And that meaning begins to formulate our beliefs. So core to the imposter syndrome experience are these feelings of I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy, or I'm not deserving, or my voice doesn't matter, or I don't matter, or I'm not lovable, right? Well, where did that belief come from? It's an experience we had, we gave it an interpretation or a meaning, and it settled in and then something else happened. And our little minds were looking for, we talked about the reticular activating system, you know, we look for evidence 
oh, you see, I'm really not good enough. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm really not worthy. And it layers and it layers and it creates this heaviness. And that's really what formulates our beliefs about ourselves in the world. Am I good enough or not? Am I worthy or not? Am I deserving or not? Wow, so powerful. And, and I love that you really put a pin in that idea about the meaning we attach as well, because our reality is created by our thoughts and the meaning that we give to them. And when you talk yeah. about our brain, like going out and we look for those examples, it's like our brain is constantly wanting to give us what it thinks we want. So when we yeah. keep telling those negative stories to ourselves, our brain will go out there looking for examples of that. And it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, well, I knew it. But the beauty yeah. is the opposite is also true. When we flip those stories, when we're able to recognize it, our brain will go looking for examples of that. So, so powerful. And tell me, how does imposter syndrome show up? What are the ways for people who aren't used to um, the concept really, or haven't thought about it much themselves? How, what are some of the ways that imposter syndrome shows up so they can recognize it? And how does it impact on us? Yeah, some of the big ones are a feeling of not belonging. They just feel like they don't fit in and I really don't deserve to have a seat at the table or nobody's going to want me to participate in this yeah. or it's comparison comparing yourself to everyone and finding yourself at the low end of the totem pole you yeah. see or you can flip that in your mind and try to put someone else down that's what happens with imposter syndrome so we don't feel like we're at the low end of the totem pole you know people pleasing having trouble saying setting boundaries saying yes all the time, even when you don't want to, yes. or you really don't have the bandwidth for it, right? And then feeling resentful because mm. you are feeling like the martyr, like, doesn't everybody see how much I have on my plate? <laughs> and perfectionism, it's like, it's never good enough. All you see are the flaws. It's like the flaws stand out. You could have the most amazing presentation, but all you'll remember is that one word you tripped over, that one slide that had a misspell or didn't show up or whatever that was, that was human, that was, you know, makes you human, makes you approach, <laughs> makes you actually a real person. But yeah. we feel like we have to be perfect or somebody's going to find out we're not good enough. You see, it always goes back to that. Oh my God, I'm going to be exposed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Now, does that resonate with any of our listeners or viewers out there? I'm suspecting a lot of these bells are going off for everybody like ding, ding, ding. Uh, and I know you've already mentioned that you advocate an inside out and an outside in approach to dealing with imposter syndrome. So tell us a little bit about that. What do you, what do you mean by that? I know I always say all of life is a negotiation and our first and most important negotiation is negotiating our mindset uh, yes. and definitely negotiating your mindset around imposter syndrome is such a game changer. And that's why I absolutely had to have Cheryl here to share with you guys, what are some ways you can start adopting approaches to help you negotiate to push past that imposter syndrome? So tell us about your approach, Cheryl. Yeah, so it is a holistic approach, um, but I'd like to share with you a concept, which I call the mind stack. So this is a term I've kind of coined, and it, it represents, if you think of a stack and the bottom of that stack being your experiences, like the first experiences you have, and every experience after that, and just above that stack, that next layer, are your beliefs, so your experiences start to feed up into your beliefs. So think of those as foundational. And just above that is your self-talk, the words you use, that inner dialogue, and your thoughts. I might be flipping those around. I think it's your thoughts and your self-talk, but those go pretty close together, although they are different, okay. although they are different. Now, just above the beliefs, actually, before you actually get into self-talk and thoughts, is your emotional identity. That's that interpretative settling of those beliefs. Okay, now I'm actually identifying as a person that is not good enough. Oh, I'm that person that is not worthy to be here. You see, oh, I must be the little weakling that nobody wants yeah. on my team. I know he's one, yes. one of those many. <laughs> um, you know, and we, or, oh, I'm just the girl, or, oh, I'm just the, you know, whatever it is, just yes. the word. That I dangerous am, uh, word. <laughs> As you go up the stack, you start to see then towards the top, but still in the subconscious mind are our behaviors because our behaviors tend to 
just be below the surface of yeah. the conscious mind, right? We do these behaviors and then we say, well, where did that come from? Yeah. Right. And then we have our habits and our actions that are more conscious. Now, even though they're coming from the subconscious and they get kind of dialed in and patterned in. So if you go from the outside and you start at the top of that and you're starting with, oh, what are my actions? What are my habits? Oh, I'm going to dip into my behaviors. You mean what? What? I interrupt everyone. Oh, I guess I shouldn't do that. Why do I do that? You know, or, oh, I eat like it turns four o'clock comes around and I'm like, or something happens and I'm nervous and, you know, go get the ice cream, whatever. Yeah. Cookies. So we wonder where that's coming from. So when you're working from the outside in, you're kind of starting at those pattern beliefs, those habits and those behaviors. But when you start, when you do the deep dive and you start from the inside out, Cindy, what you do is you go all the way back to those experiences. Mm. And you look at what the meaning was that you gave the experience. And then you do exactly what you and I were just talking about, the reframe. Yeah. Right? Well, how could I see that experience? Even the difficult ones, it's not that they didn't happen. You know, we don't erase that experience and some of them are traumatic, but we decide what's the story I'm going to keep with me? What's the narrative, the feeling I'm going to have about that, right? Because the feeling is the story. Yes. And how reframe that what am I going to learn from that you know so a three-year-old little girl and mommy drops her off to learn to swim because she wants her to be safe and that little three-year-old or four-year-old or five-year-old feels like mommy abandoned me and somebody threw me in the cold water and I'm you know danger 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 why did mommy abandon me where now we can go back as an adult we can talk to that small child yeah we said, mommy didn't abandon you. Mommy loved you. Mommy wanted you to be safe. You see? Yeah. So yeah. it's quite different. Such a game changer. I, I love that approach. And, and a real game changer and an epiphany for me as well, recognizing the power of the stories that we tell ourselves our entire life, those meanings that we attach to things. And based on expectations, sometimes we, especially if we, it, it's one of these self-fulfilling, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? We have this imposter syndrome. So we expect to be found out. We believe we're not enough. And because we're looking for that, we end up interpreting and that putting stories so that every time somebody reacts a particular way, we believe it's them telling us that we're not enough when the opposite may be true. And when we're able to flip those stories and the beauty is, do you agree, Cheryl, that we get to choose our stories, which is such a powerful place to come from. What's your experience around that? I absolutely believe that. I think the word choice is so paramount here. It's not about control. You see, control is an illusion. Yeah. But we have influence and we have choice and we always do. You see, so even when you can't control or don't have as much influence in your environment, you always have the choice about the story you're going to tell yourself. Yeah. I'll tell you, every time I get in the car to go to my hot yoga, I tell myself, oh, this is going to be like a massage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like all excited to go there. I'm ready to relax. <laughs> That's a tough story to sell. You're a good <laughs> I love that. That's so good. And I'd love if you could speak to, because I know when you gave the definition, one thing that you that really struck me at the time, and I, I forgot to dig into it, is that it's despite our accomplishments. Can you just speak to that for a moment? Like we have this pattern of feeling like we're not enough despite our accomplishments. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is, and it's cumulative, we have this feeling like we're not good enough. And then we accomplish something and our mind will say, we might celebrate it for a moment, but it doesn't last long, right? And then our mind is starting to tell us all the reasons it wasn't good enough or it could have been better. And we don't really believe it when other people tell us. Yeah. And it starts to layer on. So the accomplishments are there. The degrees are there. You've gotten the accolades. You've gotten the certificates. You've done the presentations. You've had the positions. Yeah. You stood up. Success is there. Everybody has success. Everybody yeah. has accomplishments but the person just can't see it they can't feel it yeah they just it's it's really painful for somebody when they're experiencing this yeah. 
And what happens, Cindy, is that when this is not healed, when this is not remedied early, it's cumulative. So as somebody becomes more accomplished, they bury those fears even yeah. more. It's almost like, I don't want anyone to know. I'm going to just keep putting on my confidence suit. I'm going to keep stepping out and I'm going to put on my confident voice, but they end up with this internalized anxiety. You know, it can affect their sleep, yeah. their physical health, their emotional health. It can lead to depression. It's very pervasive. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. We need to be very very careful because when a big life altering thing happens like COVID or the loss of someone, if somebody is really experiencing imposter syndrome already, yeah, it can really throw them off their game. So I was just speaking with um, a good dear colleague of mine who worked with Cheryl Sandberg yeah. and Cheryl Sandberg, as you know, has been very vocal about experiencing imposter syndrome. Cheryl Sandberg, CEO of yeah. of what used to be called Facebook. And Cheryl talks about the fact that no matter what, she was always sure she was going to be found out. Always sure. Well, when she lost her husband, I don't know if you know the story about Cheryl. No. Cheryl, her husband, she, she was on vacation in, um, in Mexico and her husband went down to the gym in the hotel and was running on the treadmill and somehow something in his attire I can't remember if it was a shoelace or if it was something got hooked on and pulled him down and he hit his head and he died wow no it was a it was a freak accident but it was a very beautiful love relationship that they shared yeah. and when she went back to her position when she was finally ready to step back in she was um she actually wrote about this in another book later and said that she was just like her confidence was shattered. Yeah. She didn't even understand why she was there or anyone would want to listen to her. Yeah. And yet she had been the COO. And of course, all of her accomplishments before that of this company for oh. how, you know? Yeah, huge, so, huge, right? So, so this is, is a big deal. This is really what I've devoted myself to now is, is really helping people get past yeah. imposter syndrome to really heal this, yeah. not just, not just live with it. Yeah. And I want you to hold that thought because I, I definitely want you to dig in on how we push past imposter syndrome, not just deal with it, not just cope. And also the confidence piece that you just touched on. And just before I have you talk a bit more, Cheryl, about pushing past imposter syndrome, you had talked about that putting on that confidence cloak, right? And, uh, and it really struck a chord with me because I think there are certain professions as well. Uh, and lawyers come to mind, having been an attorney for 30 years, um, everybody assumes, well, of course, they wouldn't suffer from imposter syndrome. And, you know, they sometimes show up with so much bravado, and ego in the room. And yet an incredible number of lawyers that I know and have dealt with over my career um, is suffer from almost crippling imposter syndrome. And as you say, put on that blustery coat of confidence. So can you speak to that a little bit just to, for some of our listeners out there who, so maybe they can show up with more empathy about other people, but also in case they recognize it in themselves. Yeah, yeah, you touch on a really, really important topic. So let me just start with confidence, because I really look at confidence as two sides of a coin. I want you to think about it this way. The inner confidence, the confidence in who I am, mm. and then the outer confidence, the confidence in how I'm showing up or how the rest of the world is perceiving me. Yeah. You see, that could be the confidence in what I do, right? The Mental model, you know, I talked earlier about the emotional model of who I am. So the mental construct of who I am is that outer shell. I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a mom, I'm a teacher, I'm a sister, I'm a wife or a brother, whatever that is. So that becomes our mental construct. And, and we learn to put on what I call the confidence suit. We learn to fake it till you make it or face it till you make it. We learn <laughs> lower our voice, speak more slowly. We learn the verbal and nonverbal communication cues to be more confident, yeah. right? And that's the outer confidence. And that's why people feel like they're an imposter because they get so good at that. And yet yeah. they still feel mm. inside 
that inner confidence, they feel like they're not good enough. I'm still not good enough. I'm really not worthy. They're going to find out that I just keep putting this suit of armor on. Yeah. That I just keep showing up the way I'm supposed to show up to fit the role that I'm in. Right. And it can be crippling. It can be crippling. So a big piece of this, and this is part of the inside out, is doing that deep dive into the inner confidence. Because I want you to flip that now. Imagine imagine you have rock solid inner confidence. You know who you are. You feel good enough. You love yourself first and foremost. And you know you're worthy of love because truly when you love yourself, you know you're worthy of love. That's that's the given. So we have to start with self-love. We know that our voice matters. Even if somebody tells us it doesn't, we're so confident. Imagine, I'm so confident. I know my voice matters. I just know that person doesn't get me. That's okay. (laughs) So now you throw me misconfidence, really inner confidence out into the world. And I have to step into this high charged situation where I have to be on fire and there's so much competition and I'm really new. Yeah. Am I going to have a little bit of fear? Sure. Am I going to be a little, little bit of doubt? Well, I've never done this before. I hope I'm going to have a little doubt. I mean, (laughs) that would be natural not to. You know, am I going to worry that somebody is a little better than I am? I might, but with the inner confidence, I might think to myself, ooh, I'm so glad Cindy's here. She's really seasoned. I get to watch her. I have a model. Oh, thank God. Oh, I see the way she's holding herself. Okay, that's good. That's a great model. That helps. You see, so I start to embrace the competition instead of just seeing myself as less than I start to say, okay, I'm really confident. You know what? I'm going to try it. I bet you I'll make a mistake. Let's just see what I get to learn today. Yeah. That was a beautiful illustration of that. And I really love that distinction, Cheryl, about that inner versus outer confidence, the two sides of the coin. And I think you've drawn a beautiful line between how that inner, when we're not feeling that inner confidence, when we haven't done the inside work or that inner work or negotiated our mindset around that, it actually deepens the imposter syndrome because now we're really expecting to be found out when we put that confidence cloak on when we're not actually feeling it. I think that was a beautiful illustration of that. And you also touched on something that I'd love you to just dig a, a, a little bit more for us on is this idea about the normal, the, the difference between imposter syndrome versus I've never done this before and I'm showing up and feeling a little nervous about that is okay. And as you said that, I was thinking about the very first hearing that I ever had. Um, I'd never even been to an arbitration case before. And my law firm, you know, threw me in early in the job and I, I didn't even know what side of the room I'm supposed to sit on and just showing up with that like, all right, just look like you know what you're doing here. And if you can just touch on the difference between that kind of normal, healthy, if you will, um, you know, uncertainty versus when you know you're into that pattern of imposter syndrome. Yeah. So, so first, let me let me just um, share this other term because I shared the mind stack. So what I was just talking about is the healthy zone. I call it the healthy zone, yeah. and it's the idea that all of this, these emotions, fear, doubt even perfectionism, comparison in the healthy zone are healthy. They're adaptive. They, they move us forward. So now I step in and to that kind of scenario and it's brand new. I have an inner dialogue going on. We are, you know, we've got a chatterbox in our mind and it never shuts up. Yeah. <laughs> it never shuts up, right? <laughs> Most of us are hearing the inner critic. We're hearing what's wrong with us or we're hearing the bully right? I have this bully that used to walk or come around with me and it was always in my ear. But now I walk into that and I say to myself, you know what? It's all going to work out. You're going to say, this is what I say to myself, by the way, Cindy, you're going to just say just the right thing at the right time. And it's going to come out really well. And, you know, it's not going to be perfect because You've not, you haven't done this before and that's okay, but go in there with the greatest intent to do the best job you can. If we're always doing the best we can, yeah, that's good enough. Yeah. Nice. See? And our best will always change. So the best I can do the first time I go into court yeah. is going to be very different than <laughs> I'm going to do the hundredth or the thousandth. Yeah. 
time I go into court, right? Yeah. And the best I do when I'm not feeling well, maybe I'm sick, is going to be different than the best I do when I'm really energized, feeling great, had good sleep and, you know, ate my Wheaties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I love these subtle, but really profound distinctions that you're drawing for us. So again, for our listeners, feel free, go back and re-listen to the episode and make sure that you're catching all the little nuances of these distinctions. And one of the things you just touched on, Cheryl, that I think is worth um, really putting a pin in as well, we have this constant inner chatterbox, and so often it's negative, negative, negative. And that is powerful when the meaning that we attach becomes our reality, but recognizing that the opposite is true. And in a, I was doing a clubhouse room this morning, and one of the women who jumped on stage talked about receiving. And I thought she was going to go to the fact that when we were talking about gender differences, said, oh, as women, we don't receive very well. Like we don't receive compliments. We try and deflect them. But she mm-hmm. actually was talking about how we receive everything. When people tell us we're not good enough, we receive it. When they tell us that we're not ready for something, we receive it. Yeah. So it was for me this beautiful distinction about we, yeah. interesting, we receive all the negative. We're happy to take that in, but we, we are often challenged receiving the positive. So recognizing again that choice and what role would you say that choice of choosing to receive the positive and letting that become the inner voice that you listen to? What role does that play in pushing past imposter syndrome? No, that, that's huge. So when you go back to that mind stack, you really have to look at each of those layers. So now you're in your thought layer. And, you know, we have, they will say anywhere from 6,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day, depending on which study and who you're talking yeah. to. It's a, a lot, you know, we're not going to pay attention to every thought, but the thoughts that really move the needle for us or stay in loop in our mind, the ones that take up residence when they really shouldn't, those are the ones we need to pay attention to. And our mind is biased yeah. to pay attention to the negative because it's wired into us through evolution yeah. because it's meant to keep us safe. We're supposed to be on, you know, we're supposed to be ready in case we're in danger in case there's a threat. So if we know that, if we're conscious about it, then we can look for the good things. We mm-hmm. can reframe in any moment. We have the ability, the choice to reframe any situation absolutely at any time but it needs to be done consciously it needs to be done consciously so you know it it takes some repatterning if you've been paying attention and allowed thoughts to loop it takes more mindfulness to repattern to create new neurological pathways you know what i mean by that the neural pathways in the mind that create the habits so we're actually it's not just our actions it's not just our behaviors that become patterned that way where the neurons connect but our beliefs our thoughts our self-talk really right so the thoughts we pay attention to it's not the thoughts that go in and out it's the ones we let move the needle it's the ones that we pay attention to and like you said i will say this cindy you talked about letting things in it is the natural state for a woman to be a receiver right just look at the way we're made we're meant to receive right? So receiving is a good thing. That is really different though, than just letting everybody's energy in. So it's really important to protect our energy. Yeah. And some great words jumped out at me there, Cheryl, that I think would bode well for everybody. So just, and, and all these gold gems are dropping from the ceiling here for you. I mean, one is intention that you said the importance of intention, the importance of choice and the power of recognizing it as a choice. Uh, you know, the power of relearning some of this stuff and repatterning it. I mean, that kind of trio is such a powerful um, internal negotiation or mindset shift that we can make that I assume would help us push past imposter syndrome. Oh, absolutely. Amazing. And sir, you had mentioned about women receiving, and it's interesting to me because I know I I was surprised, to be honest, the first time I heard you speak that both men and women suffer from imposter syndrome in almost equal numbers, like with it, you know, only decimal points apart. Um, But I'd be interested, does it show up differently um, based on gender, Cheryl, if you can share that? Yes, that's the distinction, Cindy. So that is exactly the distinction. Men and women experience imposter syndrome almost equally something like 49% men, 51% women, but differently, 
quite differently, in fact. And there's a lot of neuroscience research uh, on this because men and women's brains are different, yeah. but there's also all of the conditioning, right? Oh. The men are conditioned to that feelings or emotions make them look weak and they must look strong, right? It must be the strong one. So you imagine where imposter syndrome is already a tendency to suppress our emotions, that those emotions would be suppressed more with men. Yeah. Men also don't tend to share as much. So if something happens, they have an experience, positive or negative, men will tend, and there, there was a really good study that was just shared with me about this. Men will share with maybe three people, women will share with something like 32 people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big distinction. Yeah. Men don't suffer from stress as much as women. So when there are stressful events that occur, you know, what, when we have both men and women experiencing the same, yeah. you know, interesting, images, women will experience stress twice as much as men. Wow. So men and women experience it differently and men, women play small. We've been conditioned to play small. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've heard you speak about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I love that you've touched again. Everything is just layers. You're peeling back the onions for us here. It's so fabulous. And I really love that you've addressed because gender bias, when we talk about gender bias, and I see it all the time, and you know, whether it's in rooms and clubhouse or even experts speaking on it. And the focus is always gender bias as if it's somehow men against women. Um, and I think until we start flipping that story and recognizing gender bias crosses is across the board. I mean, it's women against other women, it's women against ourselves, but also the least talked about is that males also suffer from gender bias and expectations and stereotypes that affect their ability to show up as their full authentic self. So I, I love that you have addressed that. And also the role of conditioning versus physiological differences, because the latter I think is, is often getting ignored now. We're sort of going from one extreme to the other where we're, all, where we're ignoring that there are deep-seated conditioning that we need to address, but also the physiological. And what role would you say that plays or how can we deal with that, I guess, as we're addressing some of these issues? You know, I don't know if you're familiar with Barbara Annis. She, she does all the work on gender intelligence yes. and she has some wonderful, wonderful programs for this. But I will say that when we understand how men and women think unalike, we can appreciate those differences mm -hmm. and we can actually use those differences to our advantage. So mm -hmm. these are all positives, right? Yeah. And then as far as the conditioning, when we understand the conditioning, we can gently show women that they don't need to suddenly become masculine and act like a man to get what they want. They can be feminine. They can be authentically themselves and still raise their hand till still, you know, step up for the promotion, still have a seat at the table. And for men, we gently let them know that it doesn't make them feminine to express emotions. In fact, vulnerability is in fact their strength. Yes. And here are some ways to be able to do it in a way where it feels, I think for both sexes, both genders, I should say, um, it's just a matter of having the knowledge, but also having an atmosphere where it feels safe. Mm, that was beautifully framed. As you know, that's that's the heart of my art of feminine negotiation sort of programming and principles, right? We we all have masculine and feminine energy. And for both men and women, it was actually the subject of my TEDx talk, the rise of the feminine voice, that it's time for both men and women to start leaning into those feminine so-called soft skills and recognizing them as their strength. That was beautifully, beautifully framed, Cheryl. And you had mentioned earlier about COVID, like when something like COVID or if there's an illness, I'd love your perspective on what, what role, if any, has the pandemic played vis-a-vis um, -vis imposter syndrome? Oh, it's, it's actually had quite a large role. Um, I know there have been some studies done. I don't know what the final studies came out with, but it's something like pre-pandemic studies showed that seven out of 10 people identified as experiencing imposter syndrome since the pandemic, that number has gone up to eight or nine out of 10. I know it's wow. north of 8%, closer to 90%. Yeah. It's this rise in uncertainty. So we, we have a combination of uncertainty that's just gone on, as we all know, much longer than anyone could have imagined. Yes. <laughs> right? 
Yeah. But that uncertainty has been combined with a dramatic change in our environment. So people's work environments have changed. People have, so that combination of the work environment changing, working from home, many people lost their jobs. Yeah. Many people are trying to do now two jobs, meaning be a mother or a parent to their children, be their t- children. They had to, not necessarily now, although that may be happening again, but be a parent to their children and a teacher. Yeah. Right. And make sure they were doing their work yeah. from the work location, meaning home, new environment. Uh, it's stressful. Yeah. You know, that kind of stress is, is going to trigger the imposter syndrome experience even more. Yeah. And do you find that the, what I, I mean, I call it the global grief, which I, you know, I think people aren't recognizing the extent to which I think on an unprecedented level for our generation, we're experiencing this sense of grief and not really recognizing it as that. Does that factor in as well? Do you think, Cheryl? Yeah, I do. I do think it does. I think that's really insightful, actually, Cindy. Because I think when we understand we're grieving, now we have a starting point. Mm -hmm. You see, when people go through, for example, a divorce, they don't necessarily think of it as a grieving process. Yes. Right? We know of grieving as losing a life. We don't think of grieving as losing a livelihood or a relationship. Right? But there is grief involved in that. Now, when you know that, it doesn't mean you're not grieving, but now you say, okay, I have stages of grief and as a feeling washes over, we can honor that emotion and we can say, oh, I'm feeling really sad. Yeah. I'm feeling, but that's okay. That's normal. I should feel sad. Yeah. I've had change and let me deal with that. Oh, I'm feeling lonely. Well, that's normal. I'm not going to fight that, but what can I do to make myself feel less lonely? Now we can start to deal with that and pull ourselves out in, I would say a healthier way. But without, without suppressing the emotions, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what's dangerous when we're suppressing the emotion. And it's like, I call it a toxic resiliency. Yes. I just, resilient. I just have to be resilient after yes. and that burnout. Yeah. I did that a lot and I've gotten much better at getting vulnerable and recognizing the power in it. And I, I'm really grateful that you mentioned about divorce as well and people's reaction to that. Cause we do associate grief with death and we're such a death phobic society. Cause I do know, you know, one of our kids had been diagnosed with a serious mental health issue. And I realized, you know, I, I chose to be very public about it. Cause I thought until we start normalizing the conversation around this yeah. and letting go of the shame, things will never change. And I also mm. talked about the grieving that came with that grieving expectations for what that life may have looked like. And, and the importance of working through that to get to an acceptance of just loving and embracing here's where we're at and that's okay. Um, yeah. And I took a lot of flack from people sort of that, how dare you calling that grieving basically, right. That lack of recognition. So um, I love the opinion you put on that. I think that was beautiful. Thank you for that. Well, I'm sorry that you took grief from others. That's, that's too bad because there's a lot of wisdom in the way you handled that. And I'm grateful that you just shared that actually. And I'm sorry you went through that, but yes, when we are, you know, having to surrender sometimes. Yeah. That's, that's the illness of someone or else or yeah. the, right, the loss of what could have been. Yeah. That's all a grieving process. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a human process. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautifully put. I love that. And now your book, we're very excited about yeah. that. The Imposter Lies Within. Fabulous yeah. title, by the way. I know that's due out soon. You're putting the finishing touches on it. Tell us a little bit about it. What, what can people expect to get out of the book? Well, you know, I have written this book in a way where I really take you through the journey so you can really understand these concepts, how they stack up with real stories Mm. and and really understanding what the inside out approaches and the outside in approaches and the healthy zone is the mind stack. What's going on with the subconscious? Why are habits so difficult to change at times? What to do about it? What to do about how to handle imposter syndrome in the workplace, you see? Mm. And when we get our own resistance or resistance from others, some of these natural things that occur, what's going on with self-sabotage? So the chapters are really meant to help 
kind of take each of these concepts, build on it, and show my readers how they can get not just through imposter syndrome, but past it. Yes. Pass it. So there are exercises through the book as well. I will be coming out with a workbook that will accompany this, but that's what my hope is. Oh, so excited about it. So and we'll have to make sure to, to promote out there when the book comes, we'll update our show notes to make sure everybody can get access to it. And just as you were speaking, and I, I can't believe how quickly our time is going here, but when you'd sit in the workplace, it suddenly struck me with this aha moment. I'd love you if you can to speak for just a moment on how imposter syndrome can show up. Because I think everybody assumes imposter syndrome shows up in our professional life. But what impact does it also have in how it shows up in our personal life? Cheryl. So um, I'm sorry, are you asking how it shows up in the workplace? Both the difference I, I think and maybe I'm wrong, but I, my assumption would be that most people when they think of imposter syndrome assume or immediately rate to imposter syndrome showing up in the workplace. But I yeah. suspect that very few people consider how imposter syndrome may be showing up and sabotaging their personal life as well or relationships. Oh, absolutely. Codependent relationships. Mm. Right perfectionism. How do we push perfectionism on other people, right? There's the self-critical perfectionist, but there's the other critical perfectionist. Oh, yeah. It's almost like somebody that came into my, my imposter syndrome room and she said, I don't think I have imposter syndrome, but after I listened to you, I realized I cannot let my kids put peanut butter and jelly on their own bread. <laughs> They'll do it wrong. I can't let them cut their own bread. I can't, you know, so it, it really impacts our relationships yeah. at every level. And in the workplace, you know, we talk about who we are in the workplace and how we're dealing with things, but organizations also do things that perpetuate the imposter syndrome issue. You know, when they have bully bosses and yeah. they allow that to slide or, or they reward things like overcompensating behavior when people are working, you know, 18, 20 hour days, and that's what they're rewarding or they're yes. rewarding perfectionism. They don't realize that that's leading to attrition. That's leading to burnout. Yeah. So yeah, rewarding that martyrdom, right? And I love when you talk about relationships, because really at its core, I mean, um, imposter syndrome affects our very sense of self and yeah. that affects how we show up, which affects all of our relationships at its core. So such an important issue. So um, it, thank you so much for being here, Cheryl. I think these are gems. And I hope for all of our listeners and viewers out there, you recognize as Cheryl's sort of peeling back the layers of the onion, recognizing how many ways imposter syndrome can affect the quality of your life. So thank you, Cheryl, for being here and sharing with us. Thank you, Cindy. Wow, I really appreciate it. And I, I'm just grateful to, you know, have been actually feel very honored to have been asked to be with you. Oh, an honor to have you here. And your voice is always so gorgeously soothing. I could listen to you for hours and hours. And I always love to finish, Cheryl, by asking, what's one of the greatest mindset shifts that you've ever had in your life? It can be about this or something, one of those aha moments that shifted how you look at the world. Hmm. I would probably say say it happened that it was a time in my life where I had stepped out to work on my own I had um, left the corporate world I uh, started my own business and I lost 90 percent of my net worth in the market within a month wow and I'd also lost my largest client not because I had it was because I had told them that they really didn't need me yeah, <laughs> yeah. the proper thing to do because they didn't yeah. I had advised they didn't do an acquisition they were going to do and and that they didn't and that was sort of my my big client okay and so there I was single mom and I wasn't sleeping I was staring at the ceiling I was worrying for months on end and one day I woke up and I decided you know what I'm going to look at what I have not what I've lost yeah hmm. and I started to think about what I was grateful for hmm. and my mindset shifted like that it was amazing and so then I started to create a gratitude journal and I just started to marinate in what I was grateful for and I started to look at what I had not what I lost and I had enough yeah I was good I was good and then I started to take some action and it didn't take much you know you can't sit at home I had to get out of the house I had to go out and meet people but within weeks I was making more money than I'd ever made yeah and doing things that I loved and just 
was really back in my, mm. you know, happiness. So gratitude. Oh, such a powerful share and such a simple thing. And it's so often overlooked. I mean, the beauty is we can always find something to be grateful for, you know, whether it's just now I'm looking out the window here and just seeing the way the clouds are stretching across the sky can give you such gratitude, just breathing in fresh air and catching the scent of a whatever, you know, a lilac or so it's such simple pleasures, you know, the feel of the wind against our skin, just being able to tap into that gratitude because the beauty is it's impossible to feel fear, anger, resentment while you're in that moment of gratitude, right? So such a beautiful share. Thank you. And I do know Cheryl has some free gifts available. So for our listeners out there, make sure to first make sure to check out Cheryl on her website as well at Cheryl Anjanette, and that's S-H-E-R-Y-L, Anjanette, A-N-J-A-N-E-T-T-E.com. And we'll make sure to put that in the show notes. But also on that website, you can grab a couple of free gifts. She has an ebook, Unlock the Secret Code to Your Subconscious Mind. Very important, great tool to have, a free ebook there for you. And also Cheryl has a fabulous imposter syndrome quiz. So you can take that quiz. And again, you can find that at the website or go to... Uh, CherylAnjanette.com slash quiz. So CherylAnjanette.com slash quiz. And we'll make sure to put that in the show notes for you as well. And you can also check out Cheryl on Instagram at Cheryl Anjanette. Check out her clubhouse. I mentioned the Inside Out Club as well. And uh, you'll get lots of great value from there. And speaking of value, I'm sure you all got absolutely loads of value from this episode, practical hands-on tips that you can apply uh, in your own life to step into your power more, pushing past in- imposter syndrome, as well as a better understanding about what it is and how it maybe is affecting you in ways you hadn't thought of. So if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, make sure to do that and make sure to share it with anyone that you think could get some value. Uh, if you got value from this, make sure to give this episode a five-star rating. And, uh, and share the episode because let's face it, who could not benefit from this message about imposter syndrome? We all have it at moments in our life or the vast majority of us. And that is a wrap for this episode. So until next time, go forth and negotiate your best life on your terms so you can stop missing out and start getting more of what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. Take care.